Great. Thank you to everyone joining us nice and early for today's webinar with, uh, with, with Keith from ThoughtWorks. Uh, we've got some really interesting interesting bits to discuss today. I hope it's going to generate a lot of questions from you guys out there. Um, so please, please do get any questions uh, you do have as, as Keith's going through the presentation in via the Q&A feature. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to kind of stop and start and, and get around to raised hands, um, but we do massively encourage questions. I think one of the best and most engaging part of the, the webinar series that we run um, is that Q&A at the end when it allows you, the audience out there, to really dig in a little bit more um, into some of the topics that have, have, have come up through the, through the presentation. So please, please do use that Q&A feature, um, get those questions in. We probably have about 20, 15 minutes, 20, 15 to 20 minutes at the end to, to get through those. So yeah, plenty of time to answer answer anything and everything that you guys would like to know. Um, and we will have someone joining from the, the recruitment side of ThoughtWorks as well, so we can give you a little bit more insight into the roles that ThoughtWorks are hiring for at the moment. If you do find uh, you know find, find this presentation today uh, matches with with kind of the, the type of organisation that you're looking for, and I'm sure it will because ThoughtWorks are a, a great place to work. Um, so yeah, I'll dive into the, the introductions. So. First of all, uh, for anyone who's not aware, this, this webinar is obviously in partnership with HackerJob. Um, so HackerJob is a data-driven and engaging recruitment platform operating in the digital sector. Uh, we use key data points to find candidates' jobs uniquely based on their CV and skill sets, ensuring both candidates and companies can conduct a more relevant and targeted approach to recruitment. Uh, beyond that, we offer support before and after interviews, as well as offering candidates uh, the opportunity to show off their skills through coding challenges and project uploads. Now, as mentioned, today's web webinar is, is in partnership with ThoughtWorks. ThoughtWorks is a global software consultancy solving complex problems uh, with technology. They connect strategy and execution, helping their clients to strengthen their core technology scale with flexibility and create seamless digital experiences. They, they partner with their clients to continuously evolve their tech and enable an adaptive mindset to meet their business goals. Um, just one, one quick reminder again, please don't use the raise your hands feature. Please use Q&A. Um, if you do have any questions, please get them in um, and we will be recording the session and sending that out afterwards. That'll be available on our YouTube channel, but also via email. And we'll also send over a few of the useful links, uh, which will help you get in touch with ThoughtWorks if you're interested. Um, so that's enough from me. So just to introduce our, uh, our speaker today. So Keith Morris is a principal cloud technologist at ThoughtWorks. Uh, Keith enjoys helping organizations adopt cloud age technologies and practices. This usually involves buzzwords like cloud, digital platforms, infrastructure, automation, DevOps, and continuous delivery. Originally from Tennessee, Keith has been building teams to deliver software as a service in London since the dot-com days. Um, and that's more than enough from me. Over to Keith. Thanks a lot, Phil. Um, and thanks also to my co-presenter, Jax, here, who's decided to join us. Um, Right, so um, as Phil said, I'm going to talk today about evolutionary infrastructure. And I, oh, okay, he's, he's left now. Um, and I, uh, as a quick aside, uh, today is we've we've just launched a new branding for ThoughtWorks. I'm not really a uh, kind of marketing and branding type person, but um, um, I have uh, managed to update my deck in the nick of time so that you've got a kind of first peek into uh, our, our awesome new branding. Um, anyway, it's probably more interesting than that. Let's talk about infrastructure. Um, so a lot of organizations, obviously like cloud is a thing, right? People are adopting cloud, organizations are adopting cloud. Um, and there are various reasons for that. I think a big reason is around um, improving kind of flexibility and you know being able to get things done more quickly, get things to market more quickly and so on, and, and also kind of tapping into um, a lot of the services that cloud providers offer. I also, you know, see organizations who aren't necessarily on the public clouds using cloud type technology within data centers. So things like um, Kubernetes clusters and, um, and and often kind of package things like OpenShift and so on. Um, so we're seeing certainly a lot of our clients, a lot of organizations we work with, like even if they're not literally on the cloud, they're like trying to adopt, they really are adopting these kind of, um, I guess, practices and ways of working and, and trying to get some of the benefits uh, that come for the cloud. Um, there's pitfalls though, right? I mean, there's, there are risks, not strictly, you know, not just in the, the, the classic things that I think a lot of people worry about with public cloud of, oh, well, it's kind of shared, um, uh, you know, computers and all that, isn't that a bit scary? I think um, cloud providers tend to 
to, to, to be very strong in the way that they secure things probably more so arguably than most organizations are within their own data centers. So I think those risks tend to be a bit overplayed, but there are still risks. So then there, there are risks when you think about things like um, just the fact that there's, there's new and different um, things that you need to secure um, and also new skills that you need to learn and, and how you use the cloud in order to use it effectively and avoid you know, outages, avoid losing data. Um, if you think about exposing things like, you know, we have new threats, like if, if, if we leak out a key, an access key for our cloud, um, suddenly an attacker can do, you know, really nasty stuff really quickly to us. So, you know, it's not kind of a free ride, this cloud thing. Yes, it can help us to kind of, you know, expand our capacity quickly and contract it and, and do all kinds of really cool stuff. Um, but there's also a lot of things that we need to think about in order to use it well. So, um, and partly in, in terms of trade-offs and in terms of risks, I want to kind of address this thing because this is key. So uh, the, the talk today, I'm talking about evolutionary infrastructure. And what I mean by this is that uh, we want to build our infrastructure in a way that's easy to change because to make it easy to, to do those things that we, that we want to do with cloud of, of being able to, um, I don't know, respond to new opportunities very quickly, um, you know, fix, you know, things, you know, really quickly and, and do all that kind of cool stuff. Um, and often there's this feeling that people have in their mind that there's a trade-off between speed and reliability or speed and quality. Right. And I think this is a, this is a uh, I'm going to talk about it. This is actually a false trade off. But like the, the, the mindset that we, we tend to have, and it's a natural kind of thing to think, um, it's kind of intuitive to think that we can either choose that we're going to prioritize speed. And that means that as a consequence, we're going to have more unreliable systems because we're going to have like lower quality. We're going to be taking shortcuts in order to go fast. We're going to move fast and break things. Right. Um, and then the flip side of the mentality is to say, oh, well, actually, we can focus then on the reliability and the quality. Maybe we're in a bank or we're in healthcare or something with, you know, very serious consequences um, if something goes wrong. So we're going to not do the move fast and break things thing. Instead, we're going to uh, go slowly and carefully. And if we go slowly, this means we can improve our quality and we can uh, improve our reliability. That, so these are kind of a trade off that you can make. Um, so the, the kind of... This is a false trade-off, right? And, and, and an interesting kind of, I guess, bit of evidence or, or you know, one of the few bits of research I think that we've seen in our industry into the kind of ways of working for software development, um, particularly kind of focusing on Agile and DevOps, is a state of the DevOps report, which comes out every year from the, the Dora folks at Google, um, which they kind of wrote up in the Accelerate book uh, a few years back. Now, the research that they did, they basically, um, if you're not familiar with it, I, I highly recommend it, especially if you somebody who either is a, a manager or you have conversations with managers where you're you're trying to kind of justify the things that, uh, you know, seem like important things to do. Um, and, and they want, you know, they want data and information and all that. And this this provides a lot of really, really good data in there. They basically are, are correlating, um, you know, looking for correlations between uh, performance of an organization in whatever the things the organization measures, so whether that's revenues and, and share price or or um, higher level goals and maybe public sector organizations, um, and correlating those to the practices of how they actually work. So the kind of, you know, again, agile ways of working and so on. Um, and a lot of these mindsets, like, is there a correlation? They, they find the kind of these correlations between um, some of these ways of working. And they look at four key metrics where they found that these metrics of all the things, there are lots of things you can measure, but the ones that have the, the highest correlation to whether or not the organization performs well are these four. Um, so there's deployment frequency. How, how often um, are these organizations like getting changes into production? Um, and what's the lead time? Like how quickly does it take if you identify something wrong or you, you, know, you make a, a new feature or whatever from finishing the code to getting it actually in production into the hands of the users, how long does that take? Uh, you can look at these as being what throughput, right? We're talking about throughput versus reliability or stability. So you can kind of say, well, these these two relate to that. And then there's the change failure rate. So how often when you make a change to think, does it break something um, and maybe need to be rolled back or, or what have you? Um, and so the, the, the another one is the time to restore, um, right? So it's like, if you do have a failure, how quickly can you uh, restore service, right? When you can kind of view these things as being about um, uh, stability, uh, right? And so you would think their research would find that organizations are either good at one or the other of these, right? That intuitive thing of this being a trade-off between these two things, you would think that. What the research found is actually there's not a trade-off. Um, and in fact, organizations are either good at both or they tend not to be very good at, at both of the uh, sides of those. Um, 
And so I'll talk a little bit about why I think that is and, and, and how I think that works. So rather than this kind of a continuum of, of deciding where do you want to fall on this line of reliability versus throughput, uh, we can look at it as like a quadrant, right? And so you can say this move fast and break things idea, we're going to prioritize speed and not worry about quality. What tends to happen to organizations that make that, that try to make that trade off as they end up with a messy system that's hard to change and it actually slows them down very quickly. It's, it's not something that takes like years to build up. Um, I've, you know, when I work with kind of startups and so on, um, who've been around for maybe, you know, six months to a year, it's, it's very common to hear like founders saying, oh, it's, we, we don't, we're not as, as, as fast as we used to be. We've gotten kind of slow and, and the feeling that it's kind of a, uh, something in the people that they're, they're, they're not able to move as quickly when actually what it is, they've built up a lot of technical debt in their system. Um, and so when they try to make a change, uh, things break, um, and it's hard to untangle things when they break and so on. And so that's why they do poorly um, as, and, and why they go slow. And then there's organizations which say we're going to prioritize reliability and stability over throughput. Um, again, and, and, you know, you say finance and healthcare. Are this is a, kind of a common kind of idea that, you know, if we go slow, that means we can have more reliability. What you find in these organizations that take that approach is they end up with a fragile mess as well. So, uh, you know, I've worked in. Um, at ThoughtWorks, I worked in, in multiple financial services organizations, healthcare organizations, and poor IT is really common um, in those organizations. You have, have you know, failures which cause like change freezes because it's, it's very difficult to diagnose and isolate and, and, and to understand what's going on because a lot of technical builds up, debt builds up. And the reason for this um, is because if you can't make changes quickly, you know, it's going to slow you down, right? So if you, and, and, and also it's going to um, mean that you're going to, um, if you can't make changes quickly, it, it means that you're going to not fix small things as quickly. You tend to accumulate lists of known issues because you say, oh, well, here's a small issue, which might, you know, cause a problem at some point. Um, and if it's going to take weeks and weeks of going through process to kind of review that and so on, you just put it on the list and it stays there. And so a, a lot of that technical debt just kind of accumulates um, and at least fragile systems. So when you think about agile, lean, DevOps, whatever kind of buzzwords you want to put on this, the mentality of these tends to be this. It tends to be we want to focus, we want to prioritize both reliability and speed, um, quality and speed. And this is why the emphasis for these things, by the way, is often on things like test-driven development and continuous integration, which are actually about testing more frequently and earlier um, than later, right? Because the idea is that we use quality to improve speed. If we have our automated test suite, and we maintain it well and we keep it close, the developers are, are, are you know, running the tests as they work, uh, that means they can move faster because you have the, that confidence to move more quickly. And then speed also improves quality because any issue that pops up, you can fix and address it very quickly. You can have a very short turnaround. So you can have a, a low tolerance um, for technical debt and poor quality. Um, and so in the question of like, how do we try to get optimum levels of speed and reliability in the project? It's, it's, it's this. One of the kind of secret things, I guess, the, the tricks to this is the simplicity, actually. Um, so I think one of the things that tends to come in, especially when you have those large projects and the, the focus on quality and, and, and stability um, by, by sacrificing speed, what tends to happen is people over-engineer uh, because they say, well, you know, it's going to take us, you know, nine months um, to make a change, we better build something that can do whatever we need it to do. And so it becomes more and more complex. Um, uh, and that, you know, that just kind of builds all this stuff up. So when teams that get this right, that are really well, you know, really effective at moving quickly um, and having high quality, they tend to do it by building just what's needed, building the simplest uh, thing um, and knowing that we don't need to over engineer because if we decide we need to change something later on, we can do that with a code change. And we will have the test to make it safe to do that and to get it out quickly. So we don't need to over-engineer. Um, so I think that's really the secret ingredient to this stuff. And this is the, a key idea of this um, evolutionary architectures, um, which is a book that uh, was written by some of my colleagues um, a few years back. And the idea of this is that rather than thinking about a target architecture as a fixed static thing that we're going to build and be done with, you have to think about your system is always going to change. Um, you know, once you get it into production, uh, you know, you're going to have changing needs. You're going to have to fix things. You have to upgrade things, update things, add features, ideally remove features. And, and uh, you know, it's just a system doesn't stop changing um, until it's retired. 
And so you need to kind of plan and build your system, uh, assuming that making it easy to change. And that's the kind of thing that I want to uh, apply to infrastructure, right? Uh, using infrastructure as code. So I've got three core practices that I'm going to talk about today around this. Firstly, it's uh, defining everything as code, and that's kind of obvious. It's in the name, defining infrastructure as code. So I'll talk a little bit about, about you know, how I think about that. Um, continuously test and deliver uh, the changes to your infrastructure that you're making as code. Um, and then the third thing I'll talk about is uh, kind of more architectural and design concerns around building small uh, decoupled components. And this goes back to that thing I just said of, uh, you know, making sure to build the simplest thing and, and avoid over-engineering. You know, nice clean design is, is, is really um, important and helpful in doing that. So let's talk about defining everything as code. Um, you know, the, the, the benefits of doing this obviously are we want to make our implementation visible so anybody can see how our system is built, how our infrastructure is built by looking at the code and, and, and you know, it's, it, it's right there and that's the code that was used to actually create the system so there's no kind of question about it as opposed to documentation which might be out of date. It's also reusable so once you've written some code and you've applied it to an environment you can apply it to other environments so you can reuse your infrastructure code to make multiple instances of infrastructure which are then consistent so that, for instance, if you use the same code to create your dev environment, your QA, your staging, your, your production environment, and so on, um, you know those environments behave the same way. And if we can, we can deploy our application to one, it should deploy well to the others, and so on. Um, and the code then is testable. The infrastructure code itself is testable. So we can apply the code to a test environment. We can check it and make sure that we haven't broken anything before we apply it to a production environment. So one kind of way I like to view this is thinking about or view kind of where infrastructure fits into an overall architecture is as kind of technology capabilities, right? So if we think about, say, product capabilities or business capabilities of being like applications, right? Um, and then technical capabilities underneath that can kind of expand on those underlying uh, infrastructure and technology capabilities and say, here's some different categories which I'll talk about. Because this is the stuff that we tend to build, especially when we're using cloud, we're tending to build and configure uh, the stuff that the cloud provides to provide these different types of capabilities and services. So um, the bottom layer is kind of the, the, the basic infrastructure, right? You can think of an, an infrastructure as a service platform. It might be a public cloud again. Uh, it could be a private cloud. Could be uh, using virtualization like VMware. You can you can implement these things, and you can even uh, have bare metal clouds where you're defining, um, you know, using code to define how you want physical servers to be provisioned and configured, the operating systems installed, and you can automate that um, and drive it as code. Um, and then if you look at the kind of application runtimes, so basically this is just thinking about the things that applications directly you know, consume and, and, and work with. So whether they run on a server, whether they run on a, you know, a container cluster, um, you can think about databases and kind of um, messaging and, and, and you know, these kind of things. These are the things that you know, an application developer needs to think about how their application um, um, operates. It's kind of, you could also think about it, this as being like a PaaS um, uh, you know, platform as a service kind of thing. But delivery services, this is things like your, your pipelines and your, your tests and your things that deliver code, application code and infrastructure code uh, across different environments in the production. So what do you kind of have in place in order to enable that and make that happen? And then op services are things like monitoring, uh, maybe things like authorization, logging, and, 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 and these kind of things, secrets management and so on um, that, that are needed to kind of run an application effectively. So... The idea with cloud, obviously, is that, oh, it's going to provide a lot of this stuff for us. And I think the thing to remember here is, and, 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 and something that I often run into when we're kind of um, working with organizations who are either adopting or scaling up cloud in a big way, um, they often kind of take it for granted that, like, oh, we're going to go with AWS, say, or we're going to use, you know, Azure or Google Cloud. Um, we don't really need to worry too much about infrastructure because it's just provided for us. But you still have to kind of assemble and configure all of those bits. And so this is where you know, you're using your infrastructure as code. Even if you're using, say, Kubernetes clusters, you need to have something that is, you, know, you need to have some way of, of configuring and provisioning uh, those clusters and, and updating them and, and, and so on. And so you're essentially building environments, right? You're kind of, for the application point of view, if we talk about, I think I use the phrase application-driven infrastructure sometimes, uh, it's about thinking about what do the applications need from those things underneath, um, taking that viewpoint. And then where infrastructure automation comes in 
is into the um, is uh, basically you're you're using your your infrastructure automation tools to assemble those run times, the delivery services, and so on, and provide them to applications. And so that's just kind of a mental model that I um, have. It's often useful to talk about. Um, you know, when you're thinking about all the different tools that are out there in the infrastructure space and cloud and DevOps, um, this model is just kind of a helpful to kind of think about, okay, what are the different things we need and where do they fit? It's not like a rigid thing. You don't have to kind of obsess too much about what sits where. It's more something that just can be help, helpful um, in planning this stuff out. <clears throat> so the second of these two pillars uh, or to, uh, core practices, I should say, is to continuously test and deliver everything in terms of your infrastructure code and other stuff, right? So the idea is that you want to automatically test each change to your infrastructure before you apply it. And I want to emphasize here, and a lot of times I see a lot of people and even tools and so on that are out there that are with Terraform in particular because you have this cool Terraform plan command which you can run and it tells you what changes it are, it's going to make to an instance. We kind of think of this as like, oh, that's kind of like testing, right? And it's a useful thing to do, but it's not enough Right, because it's just telling you like what changes the tool thinks it's going to make to a given uh, instance of infrastructure. It doesn't tell you what will really happen. Um, and so this is where it's useful to kind of have like a pipeline, even for your infrastructure code. And so what we often have is, so first of all, we'll deliver changes to infrastructure when we decide we're going to do upgrading an operating system or changing a configuration of something. Uh, you know, we define that as code and then we, you know, we want to apply that to each environment in the delivery path. Again, dev, QA, staging, all that kind of thing before we apply it to production because that lets us kind of test with things and make sure that the, the, the changes that we're making to the infrastructure isn't going to break something for the applications. But even before that, it's useful to test those infrastructure changes on a kind of an infrastructure test environment before you apply it to even a dev environment. The reason being is I've, I've, I've done this, right? What I've done is I've made a change to infrastructure code that actually turned out to have an error and, and, and made the, it, 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 it hosed the, the, the DNS so that nobody could access the servers. And I didn't have a, an infrastructure test environment. I applied it straight to the kind of dev and QA environments. And that meant that those went down. And so the development teams, you know, their work was stopped, right? While I tried to figure out how to fix it without being able to log into the servers. Um, so that was a lesson to me that, I, you know, a hard, hard earned lesson to, to, to always kind of test infrastructure changes to a, an environment that nobody else cares about and isn't going to interrupt anybody else's work. So essentially for infrastructure, you treat those development and test environments uh, as production because they are business critical environments that will stop people from working and, and, and getting things done if you break them. Um, so I think we're familiar, most people are familiar with the idea of using test room development, continuous integration, continuous delivery and pipelines for applications, right? It's kind of a normal as, at least as a concept, even if not everybody is, is, you know, manages to do it as effectively and fully as they might like, um, you know, everybody should be familiar with it. And it's certainly a key thing. Certainly with ThoughtWorks projects, this is like by default how we work, right? Um, so then the same thing happens, it should be happening with our, our runtime environment. So again, if we're using something like Kubernetes, or you know, if we've got databases going on or whatever, um, we should be building those, uh, you know, defining them as code and uh, to, you know, making changes to them and upgrades, whether it's to the software or to the infrastructure code that configures them, uh, that should be happening through a pipeline. We should be doing test-driven development with those. We should write tests as we make changes to code to make sure that you know, we know when the change is, is, is correct. Um, and we should be, you know, on every time we make a change, we should be testing it in, in those kind of test environments and then delivering it. And then similarly for the infrastructure underneath. So if you have like virtual machines or again, physical servers and data centers, you really want to have pipelines for those so that if you're say upgrading the operating system and the maybe the configuration to harden the operating system on physical servers in a data center, you want to test those. Uh, you want to have them defined as code. You want to test it um, on a server that's not being used for anything important uh, before you then roll that change out to, to servers that are going to disrupt people if you get it wrong. And you can also use these pipelines to support governance and compliance and things like that, because you can um, look at what are the things that we need, whether it's a, a you know a legal regime or something like PCI compliance or or whatever. Um, you know what are the requirements for that? You can use policy as code, security as code, these kind of things to to to, to kind of specify and and run tests uh, in these test environments 
um, before, um, again, you know, it gets applied to production. And that also gives you an audit trail for changes, which helps with a lot of these compliance regimes where you have an auditor come in. You want to be able to show them with, with, with this kind of everything defined as code and delivered as pipelines, you can show them every change that's been made to your production system, you know, who made the change in source, what was the actual change. You can look at the, the actual kind of change, what firewall ports were opened or, or whatever it may be. Uh, you can look at who approved them because you can capture that. You can look at what tests and compliance checks were made and what the results of those were. Um, so that creates a very strong, um, you know, kind of system um, for compliance. <clears throat> now the third part is around these kind of the design issues of small decoupled components, right? So the thing I find with infrastructure projects, when we kind of... Um, uh, you know, so, so over the past few years, uh, it's been more and more common that, that you know, I'm working with, with, with client teams where, you know, they have infrastructure as code tooling in place, they've got projects for it, they've got, you know, often cloud, um, and these projects become messy. Uh, they grow as, as the kind of the, the amount of stuff being managed grows and the number of people working on it grows. Uh, and so basically what you get is really, really big infrastructure projects, like a huge Terraform project, huge CloudFormation project. Uh, and so what you need to do is split them up, right? This is the same as we have with software, with an application. You know, if it becomes too big and unwieldy and hard to work with and fragile, you break it into smaller pieces that are easier to work with and easier to change and test independently. So um, yes, this is kind of composable pieces um, to build your infrastructure. So modules is, a, is, is something that's often used with infrastructure code. Terraform has modules, most other um, uh, kind of tools have ways of kind of having modularized code. And these are helpful up to a point, right? Um, so if you think about it in changes of, of, you know, you make a change to a module, if you look at each of these kind of first, the first line of these kind of boxes here um, is basically a test stage for a module where you take that module, you, you, you run some tests against it and make sure it's okay. Um, and then you run your, your overall project that imports those modules um, to apply the changes, to apply the code to an environment. And then you apply that to your production environment. So the problem here is that, yeah, well, it's useful that the modules make the code more manageable. You organize your code in a better way and manage changes to the, to the, to the code within those modules. But each instance is still very, very big. And so when you run uh, the command to apply a uh, change to the infrastructure, it's still applying, you know, as a whole, this massive amount of infrastructure. I've, I've seen projects where it takes an hour or two to run, say, an apply command. And the problem with that is if something goes wrong, it's a big thing that gets broken, right? And it can be very hard to un untangle. It can be very brittle. Um, and so uh, what uh, we want to do instead is to actually make, you know, smaller pieces of, of, of you know, deployable thing. So you want to decouple those components um, into independent or releasable things. We call it architectural quantum. Um, so if you think about, I use the term generically of an infrastructure stack talking about, say, a Terraform project with its state file or a CloudFormation stack or Plumi stack and so on. Um, so you again, how do, how do we split the systems up, right? You want to you split them into these separate stack projects. And where do we want to draw the boundaries is the important thing, right? How do we chop up um, our infrastructure? And I think sometimes there are some natural boundaries or boundaries that seem natural because of the way we think about infrastructure. And I'm thinking particularly of uh, we think about like network boundaries and you think, oh, we have, say, a, a, a DNZ or, you know, the, the kind of where the, the front end things sit, web servers and so on um, in, a, in their kind of network um, segment. And then we have a separate network segment for things like, you know, middleware, um, you know, where the application logic sits and those kind of things. And then maybe we have another network segment for, for, say, data databases and those kind of things. And so we think, oh, we should divide up our infrastructure that way. And it turns out that's not... Um, really appropriate, right? The, the reasons for dividing up our networking that way is because of that's how network connections come in. And so you're creating these boundaries for, for security to have these kind of layers. But when it comes to infrastructure as code, if you have access to the API, it doesn't really matter whether, you know, the, these those boundaries don't actually provide any benefit. And actually they, they're often harmful because changes often need to be made across those different boundaries. So we want to allow align the, the boundaries between our components, between these infrastructure projects, in ways that help make make it easier and safer and faster to make changes. Right. So ways to do this: one is to think of, is to look at change patterns. What things tend to change together uh, when you're making a change to infrastructure or, or, or applications or both? 
Um, so if you, you, you tend to make changes to these kind of bits together, then maybe those belong together in a project so that you don't have to. What you don't want is where a typical common kind of change means you have to change multiple projects and then coordinate the changes between those, um, which become brittle. That's kind of a coupling, uh, tight coupling thing that's going on there. This often fits or should fit in with organizational structures with teams, right? So ideally, every kind of project has only one team that makes changes to it. They own it. Um, and they can make changes to it and deliver those changes to it without having to, to kind of coordinate with other teams other than the, the, the boundaries that they have for dependencies, which is an important thing to think about. Um, but those create kind of contracts between teams, right? So you want to kind of um, uh, you know, think about your team structures. And you can kind of do, if you're familiar with Conway's law, which is that software and systems tend to end up reflecting the organizational structure, you can do what we call the inverse Conway maneuver. This is in the, the tech radar. Um, if you're familiar with ThoughtWorks, you're probably familiar with the tech radar. One of the things we've, we've kind of put in there in the past is this thing called the inverse Conway maneuver, which is basically to think about what's the ideal architecture for our, our system, um, and then how do we make, our, make sure that our teams line up with that. So that again, you're not having to cross, as I said, you don't want to have to make changes across different projects uh, and say, you know, Terraform or CloudFormation code projects. You also don't want to, you know, you want to reduce the amount of time that a change involves multiple teams because then you have a lot of project management overhead and coordination of schedules and testing and all that. The more that changes can happen within a single team uh, with only having using clean kind of contracts, APIs, boundaries, what have you between the teams, um, you know, the better off you are. Governance is also important, thinking about how to chop up your infrastructure um, because some parts of your infrastructure might be subject to more strict compliance regimes. So, for, for example, with PCI compliance, where you're handling credit card numbers, um, systems that where a credit card number might, you know, end up passing through or, or being stored even, um, those are, are have stricter requirements. Those are the ones that the PCI compliance applies to. So if you say, let's make sure that we have, uh, you know, we understand which parts of our infrastructure are handling those numbers and have those in separate projects from the infrastructure, which, which uh, doesn't need to handle those numbers. That means you can say, you know, you're 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 reducing the the scope of of uh, what needs to worry about PCI compliance. So you don't need to kind of uh, put all the same kind of controls and things that you might need to have for your PCI compliant infrastructure with other parts of your infrastructure. And by having it in separate projects, it means you can make changes to those. You can have you know, even who who's allowed to make changes to those, and the, the processes used to approve changes all are are separate and much much easier. And then a, a fourth kind of um, thing to think about is resilience. So it might be uh, when you think about how do you recover from failures to your, to your uh, system, um, you think about what parts of your infrastructure might need to rebuild um, and have those kind of separate. So it, it might be that, uh, you know, if your servers, you know, are, are more likely to crash uh, or, or what have you, or it might need to be rebuilt in an emergency or even scaled. Um, you know, you can have those in a separate project from, say, another project which has your databases, which is, is it involves more work if you're going to make a change to your database because you have to think about what to do to the data. So if it fails, you're going to and you're going to have to restore it and then recover the data from whatever you're using to back it up. Um, or if you're kind of replacing it, you need to, you know, snapshot the data or, or, or whatever. So it's, you know, if you can separate out the, 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 the stuff, uh, the infrastructure that requires more work and is slower um, to rebuild, um, that means that overall, many of your failure scenarios you'll be able to handle more quickly, and certainly you'll be able to manage even those failure scenarios that that do involve the more, you know, again things like data and so on. Um, you know, you can manage those in a separate way because your 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 process for that is separate. Right. So I'll wrap this up and and then get into the the Q and A. Um, people often ask, so how do we know if we're doing well at this, right? And I'll come back to those those four key metrics, right? Those are the things here that that were in the the state of the DevOps report. And these are useful. First of all, when I think about infrastructure and measuring infrastructure, I think it's useful to look at these metrics for the teams that are using the infrastructure, the application teams, how well can they do against these things? Because it tends to, you know, the infrastructure can enable uh, doing well against these or they can impede it, right? If it takes, if it, if it deployment, um, you know, involves raising tickets with a, an infrastructure team, um, and that takes a lot of time because we're the way we're managing our infrastructure. This is what we want to think about. We can speed that up by optimizing how we're building our infrastructure and managing it. Um, 
And so that's kind of the ultimate proof in the pudding of, of, of our infrastructure is how, how effectively our, our application teams can work. And then from them, how effectively we're delivering on kind of business requirements. You can also apply these for bits of your infrastructure. So if you think about changes to your infrastructure for our Kubernetes cluster, how frequently, uh, you know, and how, how long does it take us when a new patch comes out? How long does it take us to roll it out? Um, how quickly can we recover and rebuild a Kubernetes cluster if something terrible happens to it? So we can kind of use these to, to kind of measure those things as well. Right, so that's what I've got in terms of slide-based content. Um, I'm gonna, let's have a look at the Q&A and see uh, uh, what people would like to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, that was really, really good. I think uh, one of the more technical uh, presentations we've had, but I think, you know, to our, our technical audience out there, I'm sure that is exactly what they want to hear. So, yeah, it was really, really good to, to see. Um, so I think the first question we've had is, uh, I believe on your, your your first or second slide, so it's, it's a false trade-off. Uh, how have you managed to get optimum levels of speed and reliability in your, your projects? I think you've already kind of touched on the, the trade-off. Yeah, I happen to actually see that fly by when I was um, <laughs> when I was talking, so I did kind of touch on that. Yeah, just to kind of to, to, to summarize it again, I guess quickly, it's it's first of all, it's using, you know, the, the, you know, the automation of testing and all those kind of things to help you to go faster, more safely at the same time. And then it's also kind of simplicity in your kind of design and implementation, um, not overcomplicating it. Um, the, again, the teams that, that work that are really effective, um, like you know, that's that's the thing you can you can tell right away when you look at their code. It's really simple and, and stripped down and, and and doesn't have fluff. Grant, thank you, thank you very much for that reiteration. So next one, uh, I guess, getting a little bit away from the techie side of things and, and maybe just giving people a little bit of insight into. ThoughtWorks. Um, so, what was it that made you want to to work for ThoughtWorks in in the first place? Yeah, it's an interesting one. So, there's a couple of things. I think one is um, so I was obviously very interested in agile and these kind of things. And then this was about I joined about ten years ago, about two uh, about uh, twenty ten, um, and uh, the continuous delivery book was just coming out, and that was really really cool and really interesting. Um, so, I had this kind of combination of like wanting to kind of like. Uh, uh, experience working with these and, 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 you know, you know, fully and, and with, with teams that really do this stuff for real. Um, and, and I got that. <laughs> um, and also it was just kind of like the chance to work with the people who were, who were, you know, doing these kind of things. Right. And it was only kind of a vague idea that like, I might be able to do that, this kind of thing myself and, and end up writing a book, but it was just like, Oh, I'll, I'll get to hang around with people, you know, who, who, who are kind of pioneering this stuff. And it was very kind of, um, um, I guess inspiring and that's what kind of then got me going to kind of like, you know, as I was working with clients and, and, and trying to help them to, to, to do things and finding better ways to do things. And I thought, oh, I can kind of share my ideas out with the world as well. Fantastic. Excellent. Um, and, and I guess since you since you've been with the business, has it has it kind of lived up to those expectations or are you kind of learning continuously from? Yeah, your... absolutely. I mean, I think the company I worked at before I was kind of it was it was fairly small um, and I felt like I was becoming kind of a big fish in a small pond. I was like a lead um, kind of developer type person there, lead infrastructure slash developer before we had DevOps as a as a thing. Um, and, uh, you know, it was kind of like ThoughtWorks is a big, <laughs> a big bond. And it's just, but it raises your game, right? Because you're working with people um, who do really cool stuff and, and, and innovate. But they're also like really, uh, you know, I found, um, you know, working with people like, say, James Lewis and Sam Newman and, and um, you know, Jez Humble and people like that. They were regular people, right? And, and team members to work with. And so it became, in some ways, less intimidating, um, uh, but also more inspiring to say, oh, if they can do it, I can do it, right? I can do this stuff too. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now I guess coming on to a, a little bit onto the, the company side of things and kind of looking at, at yeah, what, what the process is there. So um, given a company adopts uh, infrastructure's code deployment model using ARM templates, um, is it a good practice to attempt to redeploy the ARM templates alongside the application itself? Um, so I think I'm not sure whether this is uh specific to ARM templates or, or just kind of the most of the stuff I've talked, I, I talk about um, is a kind of a level where it, it you know, the things apply to different um, uh, tools, right? Um, and so I've talked about applying, like, so I guess if I'm kind of interpreting the question um, correctly, I guess is it should you apply your infrastructure code at the same time that you apply that you like say deploy an application? Yeah. Um, and I think it's, so there's two different things here. So I think one thing is it's a really useful thing to, um, to, to have whatever code is defining your infrastructure, to have it continuously being reapplied. Um, and like GitOps, part of the, the GitOps kind of approach to infrastructure as code, 
um, it, you know, it involves this and says, you know, we have, we have our code and it just gets reapplied all the time. So it's kind of a, uh, it's not a, an either or kind of thing. Um, and I guess then the question is, if you have an infrastructure change, should you deploy that change along with the applications? And I think it depends on the dependencies. I think it's nice to decouple those things and say, let's deploy the infrastructure change first, assuming it's not going to affect uh, the application, the existing application, and then let's deploy out the application change just to kind of um, separate. I like having more changes, smaller changes, uh, a smaller scope, you know, so, so yeah, uh, you know, uh, a constant stream of small changes as opposed to kind of bundling up changes together. I hope that kind of gets to what, what was asked. I guess you can put in a, another question if it didn't quite um, um, address what you were thinking of with that question. Absolutely. No, I think, I think it, it definitely does. So anyway, I think it all, all, all makes sense. I think, you know, with the advent of cloud computing, we've seen the rise of microservices. I, I think, you know, breaking the system down into smaller parts and, and being able to focus in attention on, on those various different services makes, makes total sense. Um, so we've had a question come in from, from Patrick O'Donnell. Um, so I think this is perhaps one that is on the minds of a few people, people listening. So um, any advice on winning a budgeting argument that tends to come with provisioning uh, an infra test environment? Should you aim for a semi-persistent environment or something completely ephemeral that gets uh, spun up and torn down? Yeah, I mean, it's nice to have environments, um, you know, to be able to just provision environments on demand and tear them down afterwards. Um, it kind of depends on um, the frequency of changes, I guess, because it does take time to spin up and tear down environments. And so if you have changes are quite frequent, you might, it might help to, to have them uh, persistent. Sometimes, um, we'll have like a mix where we'll like we'll, it'll spin up at the beginning of the day and then or maybe with the first test that comes through um, and then like after a certain time maybe it gets torn down or after a certain amount of idle time where, where it hasn't been used maybe it gets torn down so you can kind of think about different strategies for managing that i mean the budget thing i think it's just um you know the the, the case is uh you know safety of the changes right i mean what's the impact of, uh, I mentioned that the incident I had, I had like our development teams uh, were down for a day <laughs> while I tried to sort stuff out. Um, so, you know, I think that the benefit is there for the, the kind of reliability of being able to make changes easily, safely. Yeah, risk versus reward, right? And I think, you know, the more data you can provide to the business that, you know, the, the, the easier that you're gonna find that that battle for sure. Um, and Patrick's actually submitted a, a second question. So we'll, we'll, I think we'll stick with him, I think on a similar theme. So any opinions on keeping infra as code separate to associated applications from a source code perspective versus managing them in the same repo? So I think it kind of depends on um, how closely associated the infrastructure code is with the application um, in terms of if it's specific to the application um, it, it helps to have it nearby so that you can kind of like get your head around, you know, here's the application and the associated infrastructure. It also depends on um, uh, who, who makes changes and, and how you make changes. So if you have infrastructures managed maybe by a separate team, um, you know, I, I tend to think having repos aligned to, uh, you know, teams is useful. Um, uh, so, you know, so that's something to think about if your team is managing your infrastructure or, Aspects. So I said in some in a lot of teams, the way they 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 do it is, um, you might they might use like some shared infrastructure or infrastructure components, and then they have code which kind of deploys the infrastructure they need. So that's the stuff they would have with their application. So it's it kind of just depends on you know the association, how closely it is associated um, with with the actual application code. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. We've got another question that's in the same ballpark about kind of implementing that that IAC uh infrastructure so um it might be that you've already answered this you may have a few extra points that you'd like to add um, but a lot of the time the challenge with up adopting infrastructure as code is internal processes and culture do you have any advice on how you go about creating that shift um in the organizational mindset i guess it depends on where you're starting from um but I think generally speaking, so when we work with clients where, um, you know, we're kind of coming in and, and, and starting at this kind of level of, of saying, okay, we want to kind of do this shift. Uh, the thing that is, that's most valuable is bringing the people together from the different kind of parts. Um, so often this involves you know, people from the kind of product side of the organization as well as applications um, and infrastructure and so on. And look at what are the kind of common problems that we see. Um, and also what are the problems that the different people in, in, in different areas uh, see and getting that common view is oftentimes people haven't really talked about that and don't really necessarily see each other's viewpoints. It's not a kind of conversations they've necessarily, necessarily had very much. Um, so the reason that for, for doing that is then that should kind of lead you to 
uh, what are the problems that you you know we we're, we're you know that we all agree as a group that we need to prioritize and work on, and then when it comes to infrastructure as code, this should be kind of it should be something you're putting in place to 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 address some of those problems, right? So if your biggest problems aren't going to be fixed by infrastructure as code, they're not going to be addressed, then that's probably not what you should be doing, right? Um, uh, whereas, so it, it's kind of like thinking about, you probably have in your mind, you may have in your mind, you know, infrastructure as code, as code is going to help us in these ways. You need to kind of translate that into how is that benefit going to be seen by other people. And often that's going to be, if you're talking to like, say, even business leaders about infrastructure as code who may have no idea, like the head of product, head of marketing or whatever, um, it's, you know, it'll come down to things like, well, you know, you, you have features that you want to roll out and it kind of, you're probably frustrated that maybe you're frustrated that it takes too long. Um, you know, from you saying, oh, let's, let's, let's try to offer this thing to our customers and it takes nine months. Um, presuming that that infrastructure as it often is, is one of the kind of components that makes it take a long time setting up and planning all the infrastructure. You can look at, well, you know, how can we uh, use infrastructure as a code in order to to help alleviate that problem. And I think that also helps because it avoids us as infrastructure folks say from implementing it for our own kind of viewpoint and our own worldview without necessarily benefiting the, the, the rest of the organization. You can think about oh, our goal here is to make sure we can get features out quickly. So let's make sure that we're implementing it in a way that really helps do that. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it, it goes hand in hand with the, the kind of the, the budgetary side of things as well. I think the more you can evidence to, to, to your team that it's going to help them out they're going to see that benefit um, they have that understanding of you know what it's going to do for them then it's going to help with, with process adherence and adoption um, as well as actually getting that that budget approved in the, in the first place for sure um, we've had a couple of questions around the kind of the, the theme of testing so so i think we'll dive into those now so um joseph chandy has asked uh testing infrastructure as code um is there a tool or framework that can do this like unit testing uh, libraries in in software yeah, there are a variety of, of tools for this. Um, so there are some things, there are some that are kind of specific to, say, the Terraform ecosystem. There's TerraTest. Uh, there are some things from the folks at Chef, which are not tied into the Chef ecosystem necessarily, or not, you know, just to Chef code. Um, so InSpec is one of, you know, is a tool I, I like. They're kind of RSpec, Ruby-based um, uh, tool frameworks. Uh, and there are others out there. I think, I'm not sure how recently it's been updated, but a couple of our colleagues in Australia um, made a website called do better as um, and there they had a list of some some tools and again I'm, I'm, I haven't looked at it recently to see if it's if it's up to date my book certainly does kind of list tries to list off a few tools of, of at the time uh, but yeah there are there are tools out there um, that help you to do that Fantastic. And I think we can definitely include the, a link to that website in the, the follow-up email as well. Even if it's not right up to date, I think it'll put people on the right track um, and, and get them going down the yeah the, the right avenues to, to find the tool that's maybe best for, for their business, dependent on obviously their, their current stack and, and how their, their, their system is, is set up. Um, yeah, so staying on the, the theme of, of testing, we've got a question in from, from Neil Smith. So uh, I like the idea of, of, of CI tests for compliance, not heard of that concept before. I'm more used to unit and integration tests. Um, are there common or well-known uh, tools for testing the compliance pipeline? So I guess similar question, are there any that specific on the, the compliance side or would it be the similar sort of tools that you would use to, to test the infrastructure as a whole? Yeah, so a lot of times you can write them using the same kind of tools, um, things we do integration testing say, because um, you're just kind of asserting things like, oh, ports aren't open, that shouldn't be open or whatever it might be. Um, there are kind of, so if you, if you kind of Google the phrase compliance as code, you'll probably find a number of tools out there. Um, the folks at HashiCorp, uh, is it Sentinel maybe? They've, they've got a kind of product or service um, around this um, and, and others do as well. Um, so I don't have like very specific um, tools off the top of my head, but I know that, you know, there should be pretty easy to find some um, as well as, as, as again, using more general purpose testing tools. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Excellent. So I guess coming on to the, the, the challenges that, that you, you face, you know, with, when you, you do kind of go into various different organizations and, and help them to solve some of these, uh, yeah, these questions they have around their cloud infrastructure and things like that. Um, so I guess what are some of the maybe the, the common issues or, or, or common kind of areas you do see companies maybe going a little bit wrong? Uh, what, what are the main things that you end up kind of trying to fix, I guess? Yeah, so I think it's... <sighs> So one of the problems that people have, and this is not something that I'd say like, oh, people are getting it wrong necessarily. It's like something we're learning um, as practitioners in, in this field is, um, it's, you know, the code bases get big and then you have to kind of manage how do you run 
uh, you know, your, your infrastructure tools. We write scripts around that. And so things get very big and very messy. Um, uh, and so I think a lot, you know, a, a, a lot of what we'll tend to focus on is just organizing, uh, you know, reorganizing and breaking things apart. And it's kind of what we've done over the years with software as well. So if you're, you're familiar with microservices, which was a concept that, um, uh, you know, uh, thought workers kind of uh, popularized with James Lewis wrote an article on Martin Fowler's site, um, which really, I think, led to the taking off of microservices as a thing. Um, and I think the idea there is really, um, you know, it was, we, we, we'd be doing that all the time with applications, right? A client would ask us to come in, oh, we've got this, this application that's been around for a while and it's really hard to work with. Um, and so can you help us kind of modernize it? And so a lot of what we ended up doing was breaking it apart and, 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 and making it easier to work with. And so we're finding the same thing with infrastructure now that um, people have got these, these infrastructure projects that have been around, they've been working on for a while and they've kind of grown out of control and they just need help kind of, you know, breaking it apart and, and, and making it easier to update and keep up to date. Fantastic, thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, let's see, we've got a lot of interesting questions here, so see what we're, what we're gonna get, what we haven't answered so far. Um, yeah, be good to, to look at the other side of things, I, I guess. So obviously we, we've dealt with maybe what are the pitfalls, what are, what are the issues companies are facing. I guess in your time at ThoughtWorks, is there a particular stand, project that, that stands out in, in a positive sense where they went in and made a huge change to what a company was doing or, or had some particular like personal wins on, on your side of things? Yeah, we've had plenty. Um, I'll, um, I, I'm trying to think because it's, you know, it's, it, there's, there's clients we can mention by name and there's, there's those we, we, we can't. Um, and so there's, there's a client we worked with in, in Germany, um, uh, some years ago and they were taking very dramatic. So they were in data center and they needed to move to the cloud quite quickly, um, uh, because they're for various contractual reasons or data center hosting costs were about to go up by a multiple. Um, and they had a hard deadline on that. So they needed to go to the cloud. They also wanted to move from, uh, windows to uh, a JVM base, they actually wanted to go to Scala. Um, uh, so they, they wanted to change the language and the deployment platform. And they wanted to do this because they, they felt it would be easier to find um, talent, find people who, who knew how to work at scale uh, with kind of more Linux and Java based technologies than with, with .NET um, technologies, because they were really going internet scale. Um, and what else were they doing? They were changing from having kind of very separate development and, and, and operation silos and having kind of DevOps teams, uh, monolithic architecture to microservices. So this was just like all the things and, at, at once. And they were very ambitious and very, I think also the way that they, uh, their management approached things was very refreshing and that they were really into empowering the teams to kind of make decisions. And uh, there were a number of times when teams were kind of like debating how do we approach something and went to the managers to say, oh, can you can you kind of like make this decision for us? And they said, no, <laughs> the teams, you're the guys are going to have to work, people are going to have to work with it. Uh, so you make the call. Um, so I thought that was, yeah, that was that was a, a, a great project. And I learned a lot um, on that. And I think it worked quite well for them uh, as a business. Fantastic. And, and just a, a question for me, I guess, because it is sort of something I, I'm quite curious. You mentioned tech selection there. What, What's the ThoughtWorks approach to tech selection? Is that something that as an individual, when you go into a, a business, you have a lot of scope to advise? Do you have a kind of go-to, like this is our kind of advised tech stack if, if, it's, if it's feasible? Yeah, what's, what's the ThoughtWorks approach to tech selection? So it's very bottom up. As with a lot of things, ThoughtWorks is not a very top-down organization where it's kind of dictated, okay, this is how you, uh, you know, this is what you use and those kind of things. We don't have, um, a, a lot of consultancies will have like partnerships uh, where they get kickbacks from vendors, basically. Uh, we have partnerships with the cloud, the major cloud vendors, um, um, but that's about it. Um, so it's very much bottom up. Um, and it's based on what, what the, the, the people think, what the teams think. And it'll be client based, right? So you go into a client project and you look at their situation and you'll, you'll think, okay, what, are, what other technologies, um, you know, that would help and be appropriate here. And then you have to work with the client on that, obviously, because, you know, they have to decide that, you know, they're going to live with it, right? Um, and their people are going to live with it and use it. So they need to kind of make, you know, you need to kind of work with them to make sure that they, they you know, you know, it's, it's what they want and can, can handle and so on. Um, 
but it's very much and, and it will vary right you know and it varies over time with the, the kind of things that people tend to think so we have very active internal mailing lists and and, and chat groups are, are kind of global communities that people turn to they'll say oh we we're trying to we're facing this problem and we're trying to figure out what technology to use what's people experience experiences and so then you get like a a kind of flood of 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 kind of um, suggestions and, and, and feedback from people who've said, oh, we use this technology, we struggled making it to do this, or this technology worked really well in this situation. Um, and, and that changes over time, right? The kind of just stalled. And the tech radar is really a reflection of this, right? So when you look at the tech radar, again, this is a reflection of, uh, you know, it's, it's a very opinionated. It's not like something like other, um, like say, um, you know, companies that put out like, uh, uh, you know, research on which are the most popular technologies and all that. This is just, hey, you know, thought workers tend to think this at this moment about this tech. Um, and so like that gives you the flavor, I think, of, of you know, what, 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 you know, we would tend to, 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 to default to in projects. Great. Excellent. Um, and, and I think the next question is, is fairly, fairly similar and possibly a, a similar answer. I think it sounds like you have quite a bit of autonomy there at, at ThoughtWorks, which I think is a, is a great thing for, for, for techies everywhere. Um, so we've got a question coming from Richard Dyke. So what does your day-to-day -day look like at, at ThoughtWorks? I'm guessing quite varied uh, in the same way that the tech selection is. Yeah. Um, so most, most of us tend to work on, we're working on a client project. We work on a single client project. Um, back in the day, it was on site. Um, so, you know, we would go in, you know, so on a typical day, you know, we go to the client site, uh, you know, we go to the kind of, you know, the room where we're working with, it's usually a mix of ThoughtWorks teams and, and, and client, you know, uh, uh, people across the roles on, on, you know, developers and product managers, project managers, BAs, testers, and so on. Um, and so we'd go into you know where where those teams are. And we'll do the you know the, the usual kind of stuff. We'll do like a stand up, and then we'll we'll pair, uh, you know, for for a good chunk out of a day. Um, depending on your your role and 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 what you do on a project, you might be in more meetings than others. Um, some folks get to kind of just focus in and 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 you know sling the code, um, and others were kind of having more conversations with the clients to kind of talk about you know the planning and 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 you know uh, you know whatever it may be. Um, in, in my case, I'm often talking with people and because we're, we're you know, thinking about infrastructure and the path to production and all that. So I might be talking with like you know, having meetings with InfoSec people and, and people in, in other kind of um, uh, parts of the organization to kind of work out how are we going to kind of coordinate these things and make sure that we're doing the modern thing, you know, bringing in infrastructure as code and bringing continuous delivery of, of getting changes into production frequently. How are we going to uh, do that within the context of, of what their um, kind of working environment is like? So I have a lot of those kind of conversations. Uh, yeah, so that's a typical day, I, I think, for most, uh, uh, for most thought workers. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and I think, yeah, we'll, we'll round it off uh, with, a, with, with the final question. I think throughout the, 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 the webinar, you've touched on a few different communities. I think Tech Radar obviously would be one led, led, led more on, on the ThoughtWorks side. But in your career, how important uh, has the, the tech community been for you? And I guess, you know, leading off from that, are there any particular communities or, or enclaves online that you would kind of recommend to uh, cloud, anyone who's interested in kind of the cloud DevOps side of, uh, of things? Oh, that's good. Um... It's a really good question. I think, um, I mean, yeah, technology has been been super um, important. Um, I think one, uh, you know, so the, I don't know if you're familiar with DevOps days. Um, that's been quite awesome. We haven't had as many of those. It's been a little bit less frequent in London than it was in, in um, you know, back in the, I guess, the early days of, of, of DevOps. Um, but that's been quite a good group and very focused on, um, Kind of practitioners right it's not been a big kind of marketing heavy kind of event right it's been like techies getting together um and and, and talking about you know our experiences and all that so yeah devops days was always quite good um these days uh, i'm i'm not in any kind of like i'm in kind of a few of these kind of slack things for various things like technical leadership and so on um but I haven't really seen a good one for for infrastructure um uh, and, and these kind of things maybe the um uh, software to find talk slack is, is, is a good one for me it's mainly twitter um you know uh i just you know it's, it's picking and <laughs> following people on twitter that talk about this stuff um it's probably where i get the most interaction outside of the the, the you know the internal thought work stuff which is 
um, you know, for me is really massive because it puts me in touch with a lot of of people and I get to spend a lot of time kind of understanding, um, you know, what, what people are doing and, and how they're solving problems. I learn a lot from those. Great. Thank you very much. There's some really good insight there, I think. Um, excellent. So we're going to gonna wrap it up there for today, but look, really, really uh, massive thank you to, to Keith. I think that was one of the, the most engaging uh, chats we, we, we've had, certainly during this webinar series, some really, really good insight there. Um, and I think, yeah, we, we dove nice and deep into the, the, the tech, but also gave everyone out there a real good flavor of what it's like to, to work at ThoughtWorks. Um, as mentioned earlier, we will be following up with an email. So as many of the links and uh, various communities and all sorts that have been mentioned in today's webinar, we will try and get into that, that email. So uh, try and try and put you all on the, on the right track out there. Um, and we'll obviously be including the, the, the application link for, for ThoughtWorks. So please, please do check it out. If you're interested in anything you hear today, um, you, can, yeah, you, you, you can go on there and have a look. We'll also provide some contact details for the recruitment team at ThoughtWorks. Um, and very, finally, uh, you can apply via HackerJob as well, of course. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Keith. And thank you to everyone that was listening. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.